So recently, Derek from Vitassium released a video explaining a counterintuitive vehicle called the Blackbird that uses the wind to move faster than the wind itself. It's a great video and you must watch it before watching this video, otherwise you won't know what I'm talking about. Steve Mould and Matt Parker created a video also explaining the concept, which is very good and I highly recommend. Now, while I like the videos these guys made, I was still left with some questions. This due to the completely counterintuitive way the Blackbird works, and not their explaining abilities. So I have thrown this video together to help anyone who was like me, who at the end of their videos was like, yeah, I think I get it, but, but how does it exactly work again? I've made this video so there's no maths, but lots of nice diagrams. We'll examine how the Blackbird works by doing force analysis on the components of it. And hopefully by the end, you'll see how this is theoretically possible. So let's get to it. So let's start by imagining we're standing on the end of the turbine blade, here, and are looking down towards the hub, here. We'll assume the blades are turning anticlockwise. What we would see is a green blade, which is moving in the direction of the light green arrow. The true wind is shown in the dark blue line. Now let's imagine there is a small person riding on the blade. The wind they would feel would look like this. This is because the movement of the blade creates a virtual wind. Think of when you stick your hand out of a moving car to quote, feel the wind. This plus the true wind will combine to create an apparent wind. This will produce a force shown in black, which we can think of as having two components. These components can be redrawn. Now, there are two other forces acting on the blade, which when added to the wind forces, balance to cancel each other out. Because the force is all balanced, the blade will continue moving at a constant velocity. The horizontal grey line is the thrust created by the wind, which turns the blade. This is countered by the braking force created by the electrical generator located in the hub. The vertical grey line is the pushing force created by the wind, while the orange line is the force of the tower pushing back. Now let's look at how a boat can sail downwind at different speeds. We will consider the case when it is not moving, when it is moving slowly, when it is moving at the same speed as the wind, and when it is moving very fast. So fast that it is heading downwind faster than the wind itself. The speed has been drawn with green arrows. So first of all, I'm going to draw the wind speed, so the tip of the arrow touches the tip of the boat's velocity arrow. Now let's add the apparent wind of each test case. This is the wind that someone on the boat would feel. This is the combination of the true wind and the boat's velocity. We can add apparent wind by drawing a line from the end of the true wind arrow all the way to the boat. Now in the case of the stop boat, the apparent wind will be exactly the same as the true wind. This is because the boat has no motion. In the case of the slow boat, the apparent wind will still appear to be coming from behind the boat, but, however, it will not be in the same direction as the true wind and will be seen to be slower in speed. If you look closely, the apparent wind in the stopped case is larger than the apparent wind in the slow case. In the case of medium speed, the apparent wind will be coming side onto the boat. This is the case where we would say that the boat is moving with the wind, and is the point where people think the boat can't go any faster because there is no airflow along the A-axis to propel the boat. However, the boat can still use the air moving in the B axis to push itself forward. So now let's have the boat move really fast. So fast in fact that it is travelling faster downwind than the wind itself. In this case the apparent wind arrow will be pointing across and down. This is super trippy as now it looks like there is air movement coming from the front of the boat which should imply that the boat will be pushed backwards. This is where intuition completely breaks down and we need to do further analysis. So before we do the deeper analysis, I will explain how a sail works. A sail is shown by the dark green line. There is wind entering and leaving it. Now you can see that the wind changes direction. To get the wind to change direction, the sail has to push on it. This exerts an equal and opposite force on the sail. So to simplify the analysis, we will turn the sail into a straight line and the many little forces into one large force perpendicular to the sail. So let's turn to the case where the boat is going really fast. I have added another thin green line to indicate the sideways direction of the boat. The boat is not moving in this direction, it is just there as a reference. Now, we have to be strategic about the angle we place the sail. 
The sail line should be between the boat's velocity vector and the apparent wind, so somewhere here. Now let's add the force that the apparent wind will exert on the sail. We can imagine that the force is made up of two components. One component is in the sideways direction of the boat, while the other smaller one is in the direction the boat is travelling. Now there are two other forces that are acting on the boat. I will draw these in orange and red. These forces will all add up so that they perfectly cancel each other out. It means that the boat is neither speeding up nor slowing down. The small grey arrow represents the thrust force that the wind creates. The small red arrow is the drag force that the boat experiences. This is generated by many factors. For example, the boat's hull pushing water aside as it moves forward. The large grey line is the side force generated by the wind. This force has to be countered by the keel force. The keel is what stops the boat from sliding sideways. It is a large fin that is attached to the bottom of the boat. It makes it hard for the boat to move sideways, but doesn't impede its ability to move forward. Now, if we return to Derek's first video, we will see the animation which describes how the boat analogy can be applied to the Blackbird car. The two boats represent the propeller on the Blackbird car. I have drawn on the A and B axis that will be included in later diagrams. Now, a quick note. In this animation, the boats are spinning in the opposite direction to how I do my analysis. So just imagine this animation, but with clockwise rotation. Now, for simplicity, we will imagine that we have a propeller that has only one blade, and that this one blade is just a thin stick with a little boat on the end of it. It will be as if we are examining just the tip of one of the propeller blades. So let's have a look at the back of the Blackbird car. What we would see is a little boat that follows a circular path as it spins around the hub. Now let's say that the gear ratio inside the car has been set up so that when the boat does a full lap, it will cover a distance that is equal to the distance the car rolls forward. This will give us a one-to-one -one ratio of car movement to blade movement. If we double the length of the propeller, our boat will have to travel twice as far, and this will give us a 1 to 2 ratio. If we multiply the length of the propeller by some amount n, we will get a 1 to n ratio. Now let's turn the curved rotation of the boats into a flat line, and look at the paths the boats take on the flat AB axis. For the 1 to 1 ratio, we see that the boats will move along the green line, which is at a 45 degree angle. In the 1 to 2 ratio, we see that now the boat travels twice as far sideways compared to the 1 to 1 ratio. This means that we have a sharper angle that our boat travels along. This angle is even sharper for our 1 to n ratio because the boat is traveling sideways even more. We can see that for a given car speed, the higher the ratio we have, the faster the boat moves as it has a greater rotational distance to cover. To keep our analysis simple, we will take a look at the 1 to 1 ratio. This is good because our other boat diagrams were drawn at a 45 degree angle, which if you remember looked like this. Now to make this apply to the Blackbird, all we have to do is change the naming of the keel force, seeing as the car doesn't have a keel. So the equivalent of the keel is any force that keeps the ratio of the car movement to blade movement fixed forcing our boat to move along the green line, hence the name line holding forces. The forces that are holding the ratio in check include the grip between the wheels and the ground, as well as the forces running through the chain which drives the propeller. Now, this feels a little hand wavy magic-y, so let's look at this from another perspective, literally. Let's stop thinking of a boat and just treat it as the tip of the propeller blade. We will also remove the two component forces. Now, I will add a purple arrow to denote the movement of the blade as it rotates. So let's now draw the component forces again, but this time they will be in line with the spinning of the blade and the forward motion of the car. What we now have is a grey force that is pushing on the blade in the forward direction, and another pink force that is pushing on the blade in the opposite direction to which it is spinning. What? So if we look at the top of the car, we can start drawing these forces on. The grey force is simple to add. This force is transmitted from the blade to the hub, then into the legs of the turbine, and finally into the car's body. The pink force is not running in the same direction as the car's motion. So how does it affect the car? So in this 1 to 1 case, it will be multiplied by 1. But in the case of the 2 to 1 ratio, it would be double, 
and in the 1 to n case it would be multiplied by n. Now because the force is acting in the opposite direction of the spinning movement of the blade, it is trying to stop the system from moving. So it will be pushing our car backwards. The final force acting on the car is drag. This is the sum of all the forces trying to get the car to stop moving. For example, friction in the bearings or headwinds. I have called the dark red line wind wheel braking because the pink force generated by the wind on the blade is transferred to the chains which connects to the wheels. The force in the chains then tries to turn the wheels in the opposite direction to which they are turning. This is like trying to pedal backwards on an old fashioned fixed chain bike. Because all the forces cancel each other out, the car is neither speeding up nor slowing down. It will continue to move at the same speed, that is, faster than the speed of wind. So let's ask a question. How is the car different to a wind turbine? So if I place the Blackbird diagram next to the turbine diagram from earlier, we can see some differences. So for starters, the apparent wind approaches the blade from opposite directions, even though the true winds are the same. Another difference is that in the turbine diagram, the wind force pushes the blade in the direction of its motion, trying to speed it up, while in the blackbird, the wind force pushes the blade in the opposite direction of its motion, trying to slow it down. So what is happening to the blackbird? So this is going to sound counterintuitive, but hear me out. Let's imagine that the car body starts moving. We will say that it is moving at a speed, so that it appears that there is a headwind of this size. The car also is experiencing some drag from friction forces and wind resistance. The ground then moves towards the car body where it hits the tyres and then pushes the tyres backwards. The turning of the tyres then pulls on the chain, which in turn starts pulling on the propeller, causing it to start rotating. The tip of the propeller then starts moving. The tip movement and headwind combine to produce an apparent wind seen by the tip. This apparent wind then pushes the tip producing a force that can be broken into two components. One which is trying to stop the blade from spinning, the other pushing the blade forward in the direction of the car's movement. The pushing force is then transferred to the body of the car, causing it to move forward. As far as the body of the car is concerned, it only feels three forces. One, the pushing force from the legs of the turbine. The second is the braking force from the wheels. The third is drag from headwinds and other friction losses. Now I know what some of you might be thinking. If the car is pushing itself, could it not then drive along when there is no wind, i.e. on a still day? The answer to this question is no. It can't work on a still day. To understand why, let's look back at the boat. Let's remove the true wind. Now the apparent wind will be coming from directly in front of the boat. Now the question is how we can configure the sail so that we get some thrust. If we place the sail like this, the resulting force will push the boat backwards and sideways. If we configure it like this, then we get no forces at all. This demonstrates the importance of having the wind, because it adds some angle to the apparent wind. This apparent wind angle then allows us to angle the sail so we get some forward thrust. So we need to have some true wind for the car to move, or at least have air moving relative to the ground. Think of the treadmill demonstration of the model car. Another question you may have is, if there is wind, could we not keep speeding up to infinity? Again, the answer is no. If we increase the speed of the boat, the drag will increase and the apparent wind will make a sharper angle. This will require the sail to be turned to compensate for the angle change. This will in turn shift the direction of the force. This will greatly diminish the forwards thrust and it is clear that the drag force dominates the thrust force meaning that our boat will begin to slow down. This means that an infinite speed is not possible unless you can reduce the drag to zero. So you may be wondering, why don't sailors tack when they're heading downwind? Well, in the real world, pushing a boat through water is very difficult. We have been looking at a theoretical boat, while in reality our boat would most likely have a top speed that is much smaller due to higher drag speed ratios. So, in reality, the best thing a captain can do is point the boat straight downwind and make the sail as big as possible. The result could look something like this. This is why sailboats use a spinnaker when heading directly downwind. An example spinnaker is shown in the picture and is the large blue and white striped sail. The reason why standard boats don't go downwind faster than the wind 
but the blackbird does is because the blackbird has a very low drag. It would come under the umbrella of high performance sailing craft. These are craft that have very low drag forces and so can take advantage of the tacking downwind tactic, allowing them to go downwind faster than the wind itself. Examples include hydrofoiling boats, ice boats, and land sailing craft. So I hope this video has helped you get your head around the weird and wacky blackbird and hopefully avoid losing $10,000 reduce.